Hi, this is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'd like to talk about the fact that in some situations, it's now a lot cheaper to own your home than to rent it. And largely that's because obviously interest rates are at all time lows. So when you think about, you know, what is the value of that property and you multiply it by the current interest rate uh, and then divide it by 52 to work out, you know, what what is the interest cost per week? Uh, Quite often in a lot of parts around Australia, it's cheaper to actually own, that is the interest cost is lower than what rent you might pay. And I thought it'd be interesting just to sort of analyse and kind of unpack what are the implications of this situation? Obviously, there's some practical implications for people that are contemplating renting versus buying, but also there's probably broader market consequences as well. So what I did is I analysed uh, five different scenarios, if you like, in terms of property types or locations, uh, and I compared... Uh, I worked out what is that property worth, what would it rent for, and that way I could work out what is the interest cost versus what rental income would you have to pay to be able to occupy that property. Uh, The five categories were, I looked at a a luxury high-end boutique style apartment, you know, something sort of penthouse style situation with good views. Uh, The ones I looked at were around about 2.2 million. The next one was entry-level two-bedroom apartment in an investment grade location uh, and the ones that I looked at were around 580, 580,000. Uh, the third option was an investment grade two bedroom house in a blue chip location. So something that we would buy as an investment for around about uh, 1.2 million. The fourth was a three bedroom family home in a good quality blue chip desirable suburb with the cost of being about two and a half million. And the final of the five scenarios was a three-bedroom home in an outer suburb, uh, some, well, somewhere with that it's desirable or okay to live but might not provide a lot of capital growth. Uh, and in all circumstances, except the blue-chip family home in a desirable suburb, the interest cost was less than the rental cost. Uh, in the family home, uh, you know, the two, two and a half million three bedroom family home in a desirable suburb, uh, the interest cost was about 58 grand. The rental was about 52. So it's $6,000 uh, circa more expensive to own, uh, even at current interest rates, than to rent in that location. Um, uh, but from a, a cost perspective, uh, in terms of own versus uh, rent in all other situations, uh, it was cheaper to own. And the uh, most severe case was the investment grade apartment, two bedroom apartment and the investment grade house. Um, If you want to occupy in that location significantly cheaper. Now, I base this on an interest rate of 2.2%, which is current, which is about the lowest sort of three year fixed rate uh, that you can get for own occupy mortgages at the moment. I assumed that the interest is paid on the total cost of the purchase. So that is the purchase price plus stamp duty. So we're borrowing sort of 105, 106% of the property's value. Clearly that's not practical. We can't do that. Um, But I thought to make sure we're comparing apples with apples, you know, that we're not contributing any cash to either a renting situation or a purchasing situation, even though it's more of an academic comparison rather than a practical one, I thought was important to... Um, to to make those assumptions. Uh, I'm sure you agree it kind of defies logic that it should should always be more expensive to own your home than rent it because why, if that was the case, why would anyone rent a property? Why wouldn't you almost always decide to own it unless you were really uncertain about your longevity in a particular location? But for most people, that's not necessarily the case. Um, And my view would be that probably market forces will conspire to reverse this over time. That is that it won't be cheaper to own than rent for a long period of time. So something needs to change. Either rents need to fall or um, prices or interest rates need to climb and and possibly uh, maybe both of those things might happen. Of course, comparing just the interest cost and the rental cost 
uh, of a particular property or location doesn't really give us the full picture because of course as a homeowner there's going to be kind of additional cash flow implications or costs associated with um, living where you own and obviously the first one is maintenance you know it's it's um uh it's kind of a hidden cost i guess of home ownership uh, that is maintenance but we i think we need to really distinguish between what is true maintenance and what is improvements because when you live in your own home it is often very tempting to make improvements over time um, ones that you wouldn't obviously make if you were renting the property naturally or you, would, you wouldn't you would expect your landlord to make uh, but because you own the asset you feel like you should make it as livable as possible and enjoyable as possible which makes sense but probably should be excluded from this comparison. So really it's important just to look at the actual maintenance and obviously that's going to depend on the age of your property and the size of your property and situation and so forth but there's maintenance to include. Secondly, there's going to be other running costs that you wouldn't pay as a renter. So if you're living in an apartment, that's going to be body corporate fees, owner's corporation fees. Um, if you're living in a house, that's going to include council and water rates, uh, uh, building insurance and so on. So there's those other additional costs. And then finally, um, if you've got a home loan uh, and it's structured as principal interest repayments, it's good to look at the dollar value of the interest cost, but if you're on P&I repayments, then obviously your loan repayments on in dollar value terms will be higher than what just the interest cost is because you're repaying the principal. Now that's not lost money, that goes back to you at some point when you sell the property because you've got more equity and therefore a lower loan amount. So again, it's not prudent really to include that in this analysis. But again, it's a, just a practical implication of uh, owning versus renting, particularly if your loan is structured as P&I. So really, it's just the, um, the the maintenance, the pure maintenance, and then the the council rates and water rates and insurance and um, body corporate and those sorts of expenses. So what I did is uh, did some estimates of those expenses for those five scenarios, and you'll see the table on the blog on the website and in the show notes. Uh, actually, the, the table won't show very well in the show notes, won't format very well in the show notes, so have a look at the blog on the website. Uh, in any case, uh, the answer is that it's um, cheaper to rent either a luxury apartment or a family home in a in a blue chip suburb, in the $2.5 million family home or the $2.2 million uh, apartment. It's still cheaper to own if you're um, purchasing an entry-level kind of investment-grade apartment or investment-grade house. And it's kind of line ball uh, if you're buying a family home in an outer suburb, you know, a suburb that's probably not going to provide um, perpetual capital growth, uh, um, but still a, a sort of provide a comfortable uh, lifestyle. Um, and that's, uh, that, that sort of shows to me that um, uh, there's a potential opportunity here in the market that, that, um, that we can take advantage of. There's obviously some other considerations that we need to take into account when comparing these uh, five scenarios. The first one is naturally if you're an owner, you're going to enjoy some tax-free capital growth because obviously you've got the main residence capital gains tax exemption, so you're not going to pay any tax on the growth when you sell the property and there's not too many things that are tax-free. And in fact, I've included a link in the show notes to a podcast I did a few weeks ago around how investing in your home can be a really rewarding strategy. So it sort of links in with that one. And next, owning provides certainty. Um, so one of the problems with renting is that typically landlords only provide a 12-month contract, a rental agreement. That's typically the, the longest rental agreement you can find. And it doesn't really provide uh, renters with any long-term certainty. And that's particularly an issue for families that have school-aged children. If they need to be in a particular location or it's convenient for them to be in a particular location and the landlord changes its mind and um, decides to um, not renew the tenancy agreement, they then got to find a commensurate place within a, a pretty um, close locality to the school and that can be challenging and also can provide uncertainty and cause a bit of anxiety and stress as well so um, obviously if you own where you live that's uh, not a risk 
And so what's the potential impact here? Well, I think if it's going to be cheaper to um, uh, to own in certain situations and locations, then clearly rental demand or demand for rent, uh, rented locations will have to fall. And that's going to put downward pressure on rental amounts. Um, I think investors then in those locations will have to do more to attract pro- uh, 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 renters and or to keep their or sustain the amount that they're receiving in terms of rental income. So that might include spending a little bit more money on your property and ensuring it's up to up to uh, scratch. Um, I even had a client include uh, free internet access. Um, you know, she paid for the uh, internet access to a property. Um, some circumstances around that, but these are the sorts of things that uh, you as a landlord might have to consider to improve the marketability of your property. Um, the second thing is, I think it's likely to provide a temporary stimulus in terms of prices. You know, clearly as um, as interest rates fall, housing affordability is greatly improved. And that has to eventually result in, in increased demand for property, which would ultimately push prices higher. Now, interest rates change and they will eventually increase. So this impact won't last forever. And so it won't be perpetual. And I did a a podcast last year where I talked about there's there's only really three macroeconomic factors that provide persistent influence on the demand of property. And they tend to be population growth, money supply, employment diversification and infrastructure. Whereas interest rates tend to have a temporary temporary impact, you know, it, it ebbs and flows and so forth. So if we then return to those four characteristics, we know that the Morrison government has reaffirmed its commitment to return to previous overseas migration levels, and that'll stimulate or underpin um, property growth. Uh, and then there's interstate migration, depending on which state you're looking at, uh, and that's quite positive in both uh, Queensland and Victoria. Uh, in respect to uh, infrastructure, well, given the government's really implemented most monetary policy initiatives, you know, that is interest rates can't fall any further, the government will inevitably have to turn to fiscal policy to really stimulate the economy, which again inevitably means probably increased infrastructure uh, spending. So that's going to help the the property market, I think. And um, finally, the RBA in its uh, economic briefing uh, last week Uh, indicated its forecasts for unemployment to reduce to or return, recover to, I should say, 7.5% to 7.5% by the end of next year. So certainly there's an uptick in unemployment, but that's likely to um, fall back into line with the more sustainable uh, levels. So like unlikely to have a a, uh, a long-term impact on property demand and therefore property growth. Uh, so in the long run, I think those factors will have an Im- I- impact. But in the short run, the fact that interest rates are so low compared to rents, uh, I think rents will come down, uh, but also demand for property will rise and those two things will conspire so that it won't be cheaper to uh, own a property uh, forever. It'll just be a temporary situation. Um, so let's look at the practical implications um, in terms of owning. Obviously, you need a deposit. Uh, and or you need to qualify for a loan. So that is you need to demonstrate to a lender that you have surplus capacity to be able to service loan repayments. Obviously not everyone's going to be able to tick that box. Uh, So whilst it might be financially cheaper to own, not everyone's going to be able to do that. Uh, And then secondly, obviously you know they need a cash deposit or equity in other property. Um, If you don't have the cash uh, deposit, then potentially you can look at a family guarantee, which I've um, uh, written about in the past, but again, that's not available to everyone. Uh, so sometimes people are locked out of the property market and will remain renters uh, for those reasons. Uh, also, the other thing you need to consider, depending on your investment strategy, is that renting can preserve your borrowing capacity for other things. Uh, so that is, if you have a really high home loan, that's going to eat into your maximum borrowing capacity and therefore you might not have enough residual capacity to be able to borrow to invest. Whereas if you rent, uh, there's a a much better chance of you preserving your borrowing capacity for more income producing um, activities such as borrowing to invest. 
And look, look, I think the upshot of this analysis really suggests that if you live in a location that would be considered to be investment grade, um, then there is more and more evidence that's demonstrating that you should consider um, owning your home rather than renting it. Uh, if the reverse is true, then remaining renting uh, might be the best thing to do. Of course, there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all kind of advice. Everyone has their own um, situation and goals and so forth that is different. So, of course, you should get independent financial advice before you make any decisions like that. Anyway, I just thought it'd be interesting to look at the fact that it is cheaper, it's pretty perverse, it's cheaper to own and what the um, uh, temporary and maybe longer term impacts of that might be in respect to the property market. Anyway, that's it for me this week. Uh, until next week, bye for now.